We are going to dive into a new study and a new series on this gospel of Mark. And I am excited about how God is going to shape us as a people through the study of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, his ascension, and the promise of his glorious return, the gospel. So open to the gospel of Mark. It's Matthew, Mark, in the New Testament, so it's not too far in from the very beginning. About a month ago, my twin brother came and visited uh, Arizona, and he came to Grace Church. Some of you might have talked with him and thought you were talking with me, and then had that confusing moment when you saw me in another spot and thought, how did he, you know, clone himself so quickly? Uh, But he was here. It really was him. We're celebrating our 40th birthday next month, and he came out to just have a a celebration weekend, and we did some uh, fun things together, and we had a great time together. But the best thing that we did over the course of the weekend was we joined up with my dad and my older brother, Jeff, and we went down to downtown Phoenix, and we, we did the Phoenix Puzzle Room. This is one of those one-hour, lock yourself in the room, try to figure out all the clues and see if you can escape in the one hour. How many of you have done something like this? Just show of hands. Okay, very few of you, and I'm sad to see that because this was one, this was really fun. If you get a chance to do it, you should try it. Um, this was called the Phoenix Puzzle Room. There's other ones out there. I don't get paid a commission by, you know, promoting that one in particular. But, but we showed up. We didn't know what to expect. It's this very small door and hallway, and you get up, and they, they make you sign a waiver saying that you're not going to disclose all the secrets of the room and those kinds of things. And, uh, and, and so we begin, and they, they slip you into this story. They, they tell you the story, the backstory of what you're going to do in this room. They give you a character, and you're on this mission to find the clues and the puzzles and to to find the code to finally get out of the room and ultimately to find the lost jewels in the story. And I can't tell you more than that other than I can say that I'm slightly competitive. And my brothers and I and my dad together were just a fun (laughs) bunch. We're just, we were like so set on getting out of this room on time. And I want to report to you that we made it out with nine minutes to spare. We were stoked. We got our pictures taken with the winner signs, not the loser signs. That was, that was cool. If you have a chance to do this, you should, you should go do it. But the hour was up, and what you realize is that this is just a game. It's just a game. We didn't actually get to keep the jewels. We didn't actually get rich. We, we had a great time. We made a great memory. But that, that was it. That's the end of the benefit of this, of this story in this game. Here's the amazing thing about what you hold in your hands. If you hold a Bible, whether it's in your phone or your iPad or physically in front of you, you hold in your hands a divinely inspired treasure map. It is nothing short of a real-life treasure map guiding us with clues and puzzles and stories and realities of what's happened in history to the real eternal treasure that God has revealed to us in the gospel. And as we look this morning and begin this study in the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark, verses 1 through 8, we are embarking on somewhat of a treasure hunt this morning. Something more valuable than silver or gold awaits us in the pages of this book. Something more precious than diamonds. Something more significant than any other pursuit you have in your life. If you follow this story to the end, if you follow this map to the end, you will find, we will find salvation from our sins. We will find a transformed life in the power of the Spirit. We will find a restored relationship with God through this map. The Gospel of Mark invites us to lose ourselves in the story of Jesus. The Gospel of Mark invites us to lose ourselves and to find ourselves swallowed up in the story of his life and his teaching and to follow him all the way to the place of a wooden cross where he is nailed and crucified and suffers and dies as a substitute sacrifice for you and for me. As we follow him into the grave, and then we stand in amazement to see that the the powers of sin and death are broken and overcome in Jesus' glorious resurrection. 
There is no story so profound as this story. There is nothing as profound as this gospel. It speaks to all of us. All of you, this story is speaking to this morning, no matter how old or young, no matter where you are in your life. Listen, no matter how long you followed Jesus, the story of the gospel, the beauty and the power of the gospel pulls you farther in still. And so this morning, wherever you are, in your understanding of God, in your understanding of Jesus, in your understanding of what this book describes as the gospel, God wants to speak to all of us this morning. So that is good news. We're going to pray as we begin. God, we ask you to do what only you can do, and that is to shape us again this morning by the power of Jesus, his Holy Spirit, your spirit. We pray, God, that you would open our eyes to see not just words on a page, but why this story matters to us, how this story enfolds our lives within it, Lord, how you want to work in our lives because of it, how you're transforming the world through it. Of all the things we could be giving ourselves to over the next 45 minutes, what a privilege that we get to put our eyes in front of the greatest story ever told. We pray that you would waken our souls this morning and our lives, that we would be found holy and happy in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen couple things to know about Mark, the author of this book. Mark writes in very short, terse sentences. He doesn't waste many words. His writing is jam-packed with action. As he begins this letter, he just dives in, and so that's what we're going to do. We're going to dive in, and we're going to see in just these first eight verses, we're going to see five clues emerge that help us understand the purpose of this book. This is the overview section, but there's embedded in these eight verses, there are clues that help us to understand something important, something anticipated, something prepared, something exalted, and something powerful. I'm going to see these now. So first, let's look together at verse 1. Something important is revealed in verse 1. It's a declaration. So read it with me. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ, the Son of God. Very simple, very terse, simple sentence filled with with meaning. Right from the outset, this book smacks us in the face with this declarative promise. If you follow this map that's in your hands, it will lead you somewhere good. So it's the beginning of the gospel. This word, euangelion, this word means good news. If you follow this book, you're going to find good, good news, which is a contrast to most of the news we hear about. You turn on the TV, you most likely will find a daily dose of bad news, some other shooting that's taken place, some corruption that, that exists, some injustice that's being perpetrated. You watch the political pundits, you're going to hear more bad news about the direction of the country and the different people running for office. If you follow this book you will find good news. It will lead you there. And Mark is really clear about what the essence of this good news is. The essence of this good news is not some sort of military victory overseas. It's not a treasure chest buried in the, in the sand of some forgotten island. It's not about a promotion at work you're going to get or a sweepstakes prize that you've won. The essence of this good news comes in someone extraordinary. It's found in a person. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus. Jesus is the center of the good news. And everything good about this letter and everything good about where this map leads us is found in knowing Jesus. It's where it is. He gives this to us right up front, which is interesting because for the rest of the book, Jesus' identity is actually going to be hidden. It doesn't get revealed in the same way. Only God and the demons know Jesus. Jesus reveals himself progressively to the disciples. Ultimately, at the end of Mark chapter 15, there's this confession by a Roman centurion who who confirms in his own experience that truly, truly, this is the Son of God. But Mark tells us here in the very first verse who this is. This is someone who is unique. This is the good news about Jesus, 
Christ. That is not his last name. That's a title. Jesus Christ, meaning the anointed one, the coming king, Jesus. This king, Jesus, is not on par with the other kings of the world. He is utterly unique in his person and in his power. He is Jesus Christ, the son of God. God's very son is at the center of this good news. And this book is going to unpack for us. Everything good revealed in this letter comes from knowing Jesus. And think about it. Isn't it, isn't it amazing that God is eager for you and for me to know and experience the treasure of this good news? God is eager for us to know and receive and live in the joy of Jesus' good news that we can be rescued from our sinful brokenness of ourselves. God's eager for you to know this. You know how I know that? Because he commissioned Mark to write this gospel. Mark is the one we saw in the book of Acts. Mark was commissioned to write this gospel and tell the account so that those who read it can find hope and peace, the promise of joy and salvation from our sins that Jesus brings. God is eager for you to receive this. Are you eager to receive it this morning? Are you eager as you hold this treasure map in your hands? Do you realize what it is that you're holding? Do you realize where this journey will lead you? And the beauty of this journey into Jesus is no matter how many times you've entered into it daily for years, no matter how much you dig into the gospel to see Jesus, to see God's glory, there is always more to find. You, we never run out of the treasure of Christ. There's always more to see. There's always more wonder to comprehend. We don't just put our, our gospel coins away in a vault, safe and secure. We pull them out regularly, and we marvel at the piles of the riches of the grace in Jesus. So no matter how long you've been a Christian, the overwhelming vast riches of Jesus brings us into his life again. Something extraordinary has happened in the coming of Christ. That's our first clue. The second one is that something anticipated has happened. So after trumpeting the announcement of good news in Jesus as the centerpiece of the book, verse 1, Mark then immediately moves to quote the Old Testament to show that this, this salvation in Jesus the King has been coming for a long time. This has been anticipated. There's been an expectation for Jesus to come. The Old Testament is where we find the beginning of the beginning of the gospel. Mark writes in verse 2, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, Mark says that he's quoting Isaiah, and he is, but he's also quoting from Malachi. There's two places that this quote comes from. The first part is actually from Malachi 3, verse 1. Listen to the words of Malachi 3. You're going to see it's going to match very closely. In Malachi, these are the words, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, About 400 years before the coming of Jesus, this verse was written, this prophecy that this messenger would come. And so he quotes Malachi. Then he quotes from Isaiah 40, which came 700 years before Jesus. So there's a a gap there. And he writes, A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So why does he quote these two verses together? Well, after Malachi was written, Malachi was the last of the Old Testament prophets. So they're the ones receiving revelation from God and speaking to the people of God, God's words. And he's the last one. And after Malachi, the prophetic voice goes silent for these 400 years. So imagine, 400 years, God's people were waiting for the emergence of this messenger. So how long does it take you, as you're waiting for the news of whether or not you got a job, or if you're waiting for the doctor's report to come back to you, how long do you, do you feel like you should be waiting for that? Maybe a day or two? 
starts to get to a week and you start to get a little panicky, what about two weeks, a month, a year? You come to, at some point, you come to the realization, they're not getting back to me. They've forgotten about me. God never forgets his promises. He's always working to bring his plans of redemption to pass, even if it takes longer than you think it's supposed to take, even if it seems as if God has gone silent, even if it seems as if God has turned his back to you. He hasn't. Even if it seems as if God is against you and ignoring you, he most certainly isn't. After watching Jesus' life unfold, after being a witness to his cross and his resurrection, as he begins to write this gospel, Mark wants us to see that what God has promised, not once in Isaiah 700 years ago, not twice in Malachi 400 years ago, and then now 400 years later, now this promise in both of these books and in other places of the scriptures is fulfilled in Jesus. God never forgets his promises. This something that's been anticipated for hundreds of years is now here. The third clue of what this book is about is actually found embedded in these Old Testament verses themselves. We find something prepared. Something prepared. You see in verse 2 and in verse 3, twice we see the word prepare. Who will prepare your way? And the one who cries, prepare the way of the Lord. There is this, there is this sense in which God's announcement requires preparation. And that should make sense to us because there's nothing that we celebrate that we don't prepare for. Graduation, you send out graduation announcements ahead of time. Think about a wedding. You plan a wedding months in advance, sometimes even years in advance for some of you maybe. You plan a Super Bowl party, and you, you carefully think out and plan how this is going to work. I know some of you diehard Broncos fans, you had your special chair that nobody else could sit in as you're going to watch the game, and you had the controller exactly where it needed to be on the right-hand side, and you, you wore your cute little Broncos jersey, and you wore your cute little Broncos hat, and I got sick during the Super Bowl, so I was nauseous during it, and it makes me nauseous even thinking about it now. But the point is, is that if you're going to throw a party, you're going to prepare, right? You're going to tell people how to get to your house. You're going to tell people what time to show up. You're going to tell them what to bring. You might even clean a little bit. Or just minimally jam everything into the closets or into that one room that no one's allowed to go into. It's a party. You're going to prepare for it. The grand entrance of Jesus Christ, the Lord, the King, into the world was so massive, so cosmically huge, it required someone to come ahead of time to get the people ready. And so from Malachi on, the people waited for the messenger. 400 years goes by. Generations came and generations went. The existence of nations came and went. All of American history would be swallowed up waiting for this messenger. And Israel longed for the coming deliverer. And all they heard was silence until verse 4. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. <laughs> I told you that Mark has this really terse style of writing. Things just happen in the Gospel of Mark. Everything in Mark is immediately. And in this case, John just appears out of nowhere. We don't have any background in this Gospel of John. He just appears, and he begins baptizing people in the River Jordan. What is up with this? What's the story behind John? He's dressed crazy. He's got this camel hair shirt and leather belt, and this is not because he's trying to be some sort of like ancient hipster. He's eating bugs and honey. What is the deal with this guy? It seems so strange to us, but the significance of this would not have been, not have been lost on the Jewish readers. John's clothes were speaking a message even before his words spoke. It signified that God's prophetic silence 
was over. The 400 years of waiting was done. He's dressed like this because he's dressed in the likeness of the prophet Elijah, who, if you go and read 2 Kings chapter 1, is described also as wearing a garment of hair and a leather belt. Interestingly enough, in Malachi, back in the Malachi, how he had Malachi, Isaiah, back in Malachi 4, we we heard Malachi 3, there's a messenger coming. Malachi 4 goes on to say that God is going to send Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of judgment. And then if you read in Luke chapter 1, Gabriel the angel says that this John will minister in the spirit and the power of Elijah, Luke 1, 17. So his prophetic role has been encapsulated in this idea of his clothes. And his diet, though disgusting and mysterious to us, carries some sort of redemptive symbolism. Remember the plagues in in Exodus and the locusts that came and swarmed the land. So whether this is some idea of the removal of spiritual plagues in Jesus or the honey representing this, the promised land that Jesus would usher in. We don't know for sure what this diet represents, but it's likely that because of the clothes, it has some sort of redemptive purpose. What we do know is this. The Isaiah messenger has come. The Malachi messenger has come. The Elijah prophet has come. And this one comes and he has something to say. He has something to preach. And you know what he's talking about? Sin. Sin. He's proclaiming repentance from Sin. You've got to deal with your sin. Your life is broken because of your sin. Your life is off track because of your sin. You cannot pretend that everything is all right. You can't blame somebody else for your problems. It's not always the other person's fault. You're a sinner. You need to humble yourself before God and repent. And if you do, there will be forgiveness. It's not an accident that this is the message of John. He is preparing the way for the Lord. And this is what the Lord was coming to address. Not to increase our standard of living, but to increase the sight of our sin so that we could run to the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Now, you might gather that this is not a happy-go-lucky message and that increasingly the church is turning away from this message watering down this message, toning it down. Church is becoming in many places, you know, a place you go to hear an inspirational speech or to learn a few practical things about how to organize your life, sprinkled in with a few verses, not addressing your deepest need, which is your brokenness before God and your sin and your relationship that's been broken because of your idolatry. If you look around at the mega churches across this land and ask yourself this question, are they preaching John's message. And if not, why not? Here's a reason, maybe. Confronting sin is difficult. It's it's hard. It, It means that there is a standard of holiness that God has called us to, and when we have failed to meet it, we have to say that we're wrong. Ooh, that's hard. But that's the problem. People don't like to be confronted. I don't like confrontation. We, as people, don't like confrontation. We like to have our egos stroked and to be told how great we are. Calling people to repent is not a great church growth strategy. Unless, of course, you're John. Because with him, all church growth strategies get thrown out the window. He's decked out in his weird clothes. He's eating disgusting food. He's preaching repentance and the forgiveness of sins, and people are flocking to him by the droves. All of southern Israel comes out to see this one. Almost overnight, John has a ministry that would make Joel Osteen jealous. People come out, and they begin confessing their sins, and they're being baptized. Because John's message is true. It's true for them and it's true for us. Inside every one of us is a spiritual broken compass that's not pointed where it should be pointed, true north, pointed at God. It's pointed back at self. And with this broken compass, all of us who have this then begin to define happiness, not around God, but around 
ourselves, what makes me comfortable, what makes me happy, what makes me loved, what doesn't push me around, what helps me become more successful. Self-pursuit becomes the very thing we live for. It becomes what we worship. And we know that John's message is true because when we try to find our happiness through this broken spiritual compass of ourselves, we never find it. It never lasts. Fleeting moments at best. This is because we were made to find joy in the worship and service of another. The one who made us, designed us this way. To find our happiness and delight in God. And through all the things that God has made to let it stir up within us this greater delight in the giver of the gifts than the gifts themselves. This is the repentance and faith he's talking about here. He's talking about turning away from the broken compass of our idolatries, the things we worship that are not God. And we do this, friends, convinced that the love and worship and joy found in knowing and treasuring Jesus is true, true north. We're convinced of that by this gospel. And that's what John is calling these people to in repentance. You notice he's not trying to gather a crowd for himself. He's not trying to build his own church. He is preparing the way for the one who is to come and for those who see him to see him in glory. Clue number four is something exalted. Verse seven. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. See, John knew. John knew. The forgiveness that John promised was never something he could give. He was making a promise on the basis of another who was, was to come. John's role was to prepare the people. He baptized them with water, but this baptism was an external thing. It, it couldn't get to the heart. It was meant to point forward to the one who could do something about the heart. That's Jesus. John knew there's one Messiah, one Son of God, only one person who can take away the penalty and power of sins, and it's not you, and it's not me. And John knew that it wasn't him. It's Jesus. And so here he is. Think about it. Here he is. He's at the peak of his ministry. He just appeared, but John actually has a story. You can read the other Gospels about his background and his life a little bit as he grew up to be a man. And John is at the peak of his ministry with all of Israel looking to him for leadership. And his fame is spreading across the land. And he realizes that his platform has been given for him to point people to another. Not to point them to himself, to point others to the extravagant greatness of Jesus. Have you realized that too? That your platform, whatever platform you've been given, is not to draw people into yourself. It's to point people to the extravagant greatness of Jesus. And that no matter how great you are in the sight of man, Jesus is better. Don't give people seconds, you know, like secondary material and giving them you. Give them Jesus. He's better. Jesus would actually go on to say that among men, John the Baptist was the greatest. But the chasm between the greatest man and the God-man is immeasurable. Words begin to fail to describe the difference. It's greater than the difference between one of those dried-up little creek riverbeds that you pass as you drive on the road and the Grand Canyon. It's greater than the difference between the light from your phone screen at night when you're trying to find your way in the dark and the blazing brilliance of the sun. It's greater than the might of a field mouse compared to a thousand armies. Illustrations don't work adequately, but John reaches for one to try to convey the exalted status of Jesus and his own lowliness in comparison. And so he says, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. This is a reference to the culture that they had where Hebrew slaves were required to do menial tasks, but they were not required to stoop down and remove a fellow Israelite's sandals. This was the task for the lowly Gentile servants. 
So he's saying his view of himself in comparison to this Jesus, the one who is to come, is that he's not even worthy to be the lowliest Gentile servant compared to the king. Something exalted is here in Jesus. Something exalted has come in Christ, the king. And when you see him as he is, as he truly is, through the revelation of the word here, it has this effect of lowering yourself. See, that's where true humility comes from. It comes from seeing Jesus. It doesn't come from you beating yourself down and telling yourself what a worthless scumbag you are. It's not where true humility comes from. It doesn't come from thinking bad thoughts about yourself. It comes from thinking great and glorious and exalted thoughts about Jesus and of his worth, and of his value, and of his love, and of his care, and of his shepherding. As you think about him, you stop thinking about yourself. When your life revolves around true north, you stop going off track. I think that's why Tim Keller wrote this. He said, the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or less of myself. It is thinking of myself less. I stop connecting every experience, every conversation with myself. In fact, I stop thinking about myself, the freedom of self-forgetfulness, the blessed rest that only self-forgetfulness brings. I want to throw out a joyful challenge to you this week. If you will spend this next week pursuing this knowledge of Jesus, seriously going hard after knowing him and understanding him and loving him with a hunger and thirst to get into his word, if you give yourself to the throwaway minutes of your day, meditating on an aspect of Jesus and his love and his accomplishments for you, you will find yourself captivated, enthralled, less inclined to want to talk about your accomplishments, more inclined to want to talk about Jesus the true hero, the true savior, the only one who truly deserves to be exalted. So less selfies, more savior. There's one last clue in this opening section. And now we come to something of the mission and purpose of Jesus. Something powerful comes in Christ. Verse 8, John continues. He says, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. If you've been a Christian for a long time, you might just glaze over those words. But Jesus does something that no one else can do. John can baptize with water. Water just takes away dirt from the outside of the body. What Jesus does is wholly new, wholly different, a powerful renovation project. He does his work on the inside, scaffolding not on the outside. He works on the soul. To those who repent from their sins, he washes you clean on the inside with the Holy Spirit. All of these passages in the Old Testament about the Spirit being poured out, like Isaiah 32, Isaiah 44, Ezekiel 36, these promises of the Spirit that's going to come and give a new heart and to cleanse us, all of these promises are meant to convey that the Spirit brings about internal transformation, not just external religion. God gets into the deep, dark nook and crannies of your heart and of your soul and does amazing, transformative work. This is the substance of Christ's ministry. You come just as you are, but Jesus doesn't let you stay just as you are. His Spirit compels you and motivates you and moves you to change as we behold his glory, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Beholding his glory with unveiled face, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to the next. The church, universal, the church, Grace Church, those who are believers, we are progressively being changed into the very image of Jesus Christ himself, holy and happy away from sinful and miserable. And that's why John's baptism is not enough. People are convicted, but they aren't changed. They aren't cleansed and empowered by the Holy Spirit until Jesus comes. And Jesus dies. 
bearing on his shoulders on the cross the wrath that we have earned for our sins, taking it upon himself as a substitute for us, and dying in our place. And then resurrected in God's power, and ascended on high, and then the Spirit is given. And then his disciples could go, go from cowards to turning the whole world upside down. There's this transformation that takes place. So here's some really good news for you this morning. This will help you right now. God is transforming his world for his glory one life at a time through the gospel as sinners lose themselves in the story of Jesus with repentance and faith. Are you a part of that story or are you reading about that story? Are you in that story? Are you living that story? That's one of the markers you can look at in your life to see if you're really a Christian is if you are desiring to change. And that doesn't ever end. You don't get to a certain age and then you've just reached it. No, you'll age out of progressive sanctification, progressive change when you die and go to heaven. That's when that will end. So no matter how old you are, no matter how mature you are, no matter how new you are to Christianity, if you are a believer, God's spirit inside of you gives you a taste for holiness, a a joy to obey him. So are you eager to see God transform you? Are you willing to be in relationship with the body of Christ so that people can know your life and speak into it if they see you straying from the Lord? That's what we must be as the church. That's why the church, one of the reasons why the church exists. We must say no to some good things in order to say yes to the better things. To grow in our knowledge of the news of Christ, to be shaped by the gospel so that we would be authentically people who know Christ treasure Christ, live for Christ, and then proclaim him to all the world. As we come to a celebration of communion, something extraordinary has happened in Jesus. Something anticipated, something prepared. Something extraordinary, something anticipated, something prepared about someone who is exalted, someone who is powerful. The opening of the Gospel of Mark reveals to us that the King has come. The King has come, and each of us must decide whether we will live under the Lordship of this King. Not just a one-time decision, but ongoingly. Even today, even now as we take communion, it's an opportunity for us to renew our commitment as a response to this Gospel and to submit ourselves to this King. And as we do, he promises to wash us clean again and to transform us. So we're going to take communion now in just a moment. Let's pray before we do. God, we pray with joyful hearts as we come to communion now because something extraordinary has happened. Something long anticipated has finally come. Something of of Massive preparation has come to pass about someone who is exalted and is powerful, and that is Jesus. We turn away from ourselves and look at him again this morning in order that in gazing upon him, we might become like him and that you might use us. Help us to deal with our sin, Lord. Thank you for the gift of repentance that can be washed away, sins washed away by the gospel. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.